Hey. <laughs> you hear me? I, I can't hear you yet there. Uh, can you hear us now? Yep. Perfect. How are you doing? Good. Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, I pulled up the article again and was looking through it. And uh, so, you know, Thanks for coming on. And uh, I haven't done it in a while. So I, I did about three of these podcasts um, during the pandemic with something to do, but uh, mm -hmm. um, kind of stalled out. It's hard to find people that were really interested in this, it, like trying to look at, you know, art and then science and then trying to do something in between. Um, mm -hmm. it's, trying to, it's hard to find people because usually they're all the way in one area, all the way in the other area, but not really looking in between. Um, so I guess uh, maybe we could start out, if you guys could like introduce yourselves and maybe talk about your background a little bit. Mm -hmm. First one. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I've just finished a PhD at the University of Sheffield. So that's in uh, tribology, which is kind of the study of uh, friction lubrication and wear, so how different things where so you can imagine like a lot of machine components, this is like very relevant for. Um, and so, yeah, the reason I got involved in this project is because one thing I do is use ultrasound and to kind of measure oil layers and grease layers inside wind turbine bearings. Um, and that's using this kind of resonance method. Um, and so, but yeah, that's my kind of involvement, how I got to this stage. And that's where uh, obviously Dave came and kind of took those resonance sounds and then made that into a more of a musical uh, kind of track. Yeah, and um, so yeah, my, my background is heavier on the music side. Um, I've, I've always been a musician and I studied music technology as a bachelor's level. And then I went back to study acoustics engineering um, as a postgrad. And that was obviously more the more science of sound quite physics heavy um, and just yeah engineering so I, I sort of went to work in engineering acoustics um, so it would be a lot of I'm not sure how you'd say this you'd sort of go in to solve the acoustical problems in buildings and in, in sort of developments things like that so it was very heavy on the engineering side and less heavy on the creative side um, then eventually I started working in all sorts of jobs um, as a lot of musicians do and then found my way into the sort of research realm at Leeds, at University of Leeds, and project managing the um, EPSRC grant that Rob Dwyer Joyce is the PI on. And then I sort of wanted to merge two worlds because I was fascinated by the research. And then also I had these sort of musical creative ideas that are, are kind of fun to sort of, um, I don't know, bring research into the sort of, the normal realm of everyone else, let's say. So something that everyone can digest. And then I met Will. Um, although Will doesn't work on the same grant, we sort of work, share the office in Sheffield when I come to visit. And um, I love the idea of something with ultrasound and then we've got the ball rolling with just a few ideas. And then, yeah, that leads us to, to here, to this project. You're, you're David Brady and you're Will Gray, right? Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you guys need to. <laughs> Uh, so, but it sounds like you, you know, you use uh, sounds from many different applications from several different projects, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the project you're working on. You were looking at other, incorporating other sounds. Or yeah. Other, uh, yeah. So yeah. we could talk about um, the sort of project that Will did as well. I mean, another side of it, it was sort of twofold in this particular piece of outreach. Um, it was half the work at Sheffield, which is what Will's involved with, and then half the work at University of Leeds, which was um, our hip simulators. So I, don't, I can obviously talk about that, but Will's the expert on the um, the ultrasonic um, bearing measurements. And um, yeah, it was, so they are the two factors. So if, when I was presenting this work initially at STLE uh, with a poster, it was sort of day two realms, whereas one is a lot more, um, tactile and tangible that's the sort of uh, the sounds of the hip simulator the sounds are right there and you know they're easy to get hold of you just micro place a microphone and choose what to record whereas the sort of work with will was a lot more we had to use a lot more imagination because it was harder to get that 
It's, it's it was it ultrasonic, so it's not. Uh, the human can't hear it, right? So mm -hmm. you had to convert it, I guess. I guess talk a little more about what actually you did, like um, some of the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess a little on. So the actual sound that I'm recording. So you're right, ultrasound is way above um, kind of audible hearing. So over about 20 kilohertz, you can't really hear anything. Um, the actual work I was doing, you're actually talking megahertz, so orders of magnitude bigger than that. Um, and kind of the way that sound works, it can propagate very well through, these waves propagate very well through uh, solids and liquids. And so the, the actual work I was looking at is, if you imagine like a, a large bearing inside a turbine, it could be any kind of bearing really, you kind of get these uh, oil films form on the raceways and that obviously aids in the lubrication. And so the idea is that you monitor this kind of oil film and that ensures that you're not getting wear or anything in your machinery components. So that's kind of the purpose of doing this. And the way we actually do that is by causing a very low amplitude resonance in that oil layer. So um, when that kind of oil layer, just to talk a little bit about the mass, but not too much when it's a quarter of your ultrasonic wavelength, you actually get this very slight resonance. Um, and so in the ultrasonic work, you kind of record what frequency this resonance occurs at. And that's like in the, um, like really high. So that's like 1.3 megawatts, something like that. So obviously way higher than you could ever hear. So it was kind of Josh's and Dave's job uh, to take this really high frequency that we have and kind of shrink that down or have whatever crazy math you did, pull <laughs> that down so you can then hear it. Um, but rather than like the hip work where you're actually hearing like the click of the simulator, this is the actual kind of changing resonance of that oil layer. So that's why it's a little bit more involved to kind of get that sound out. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. So <laughs> you're getting some, you know, very technical detail. So you're, you actually resonate, find a resonance of the film and, you know, think a little bit about music. And instruments, aren't you resonating a string or mm. air in a certain volume, like a tube or something, depending on what that kind of instrument is. But it seems like that's interesting. You're you look at similar resonance. So like the the bearing is kind of a musical instrument in a way because you're you're trying to resonate. Uh, yeah, the film, right? sense, yeah, that's it's the same thing. Is a resonance is a resonance. It's just rather than resonating like a string or a note, whatever we're resonating an oil film that's like 100, 200 microns, 400 microns thick. It's incredibly small. Mm. And so you're getting a very, very small resonance, but it's a resonance all the same. And it's how do we listen to that resonance? Um, I always pictured it like, um, if you think about like a piano, like you said, I mean, any, any acoustic instrument, you, something resonates and something usually, um, something normally happens and then something resonates to amplify the sound. So like with a piano, you have the string vibrating and then the big metal board resonates to amplify the sound. And, and I always pictured this with the little oil film as, you know, that's maybe that is a tiny little string or a bow making a resonant. And then what we're doing is somehow we're being the, the amplifier, yeah. we're somehow getting that into a, a stage using code, using using all this yeah. trickery to turn it into a sort of audible noise. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. So does the uh, how does the sound, the ultrasonics or the ultrasonic sound, how does it change? Uh, you know, when you have a liquid, the film versus if there's contact. Uh, does how does the sound change? Yeah, so that's it, a really Good question. So what I was kind of looking at is what we call a free film. So um, you have like a steel layer, which would be your bearing, and then an oil layer on top of that, and then you would have an air layer. Um, and so whether it's steel, oil, and air, or steel, oil, and steel, actually changes the phase at which the resonance occurs, um, but it can still resonate all the same. So a trapped film can resonate just as well as one mm. of these films. Um, and what we actually do is the film thickness is related to that kind of resonant frequency. So the thicker and thicker that oil film gets, kind of the lower and lower the frequency gets. So if this film changes, you can actually monitor using the ultrasound uh, method. 
that frequency, that resonant frequency change, and you can then like interpret from that film thickness change um, with inside your bow. Yeah, it makes sense because you're talking about the you know, long, longer the film, the the lower the frequency, and, and just like with an instrument, the longer the string. It, mm. Exactly, it's, it's the same science. It's, we're just causing a resonance on something that's extremely small mm -hmm. uh, instead of like a guitar string, for example. Uh, right. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Like how the rules of something large still apply. Yeah, I, yeah. I always think of it like, you know, gravity and then quantum mechanics is a sort of breakdown there. But between this and that, it's exactly the same rule, isn't there? It's your your resonant frequency will be related mathematically to the depth or the, exactly. the thickness. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's always pretty cool. I mean, it's the same same rules as if you're building a partition wall, you go, that material's that thick and that dense, so then it would resonate or it wouldn't resonate or it would stop the resonance yeah. because there's an air pocket or a gap yeah, or yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. the composite of material, 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 depth and thickness. Yeah. Yeah. Just, that's like tens of hertz or hundreds of hertz, yeah. kilohertz. this is megahertz, but it's, yeah. like, it's just a scale, I guess. Isn't yeah, it? Like, exactly. The frequency at which this occurs. Yeah. Um, we could play it. I have it pulled up. Um, <laughs> Feel free that makes, to. It makes more sense to me now because I was, you know, when I played it before, they, mm -hmm. so I don't know, maybe I can show this on the screen. Okay. So here, this is from uh, their article that's online at friction.org. UK. So when I post this, I'll post the address too, but uh
we can we probably let Will talk a bit about uh, the imagery here because this is yeah. another thing we've on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah what do the images mean? Yeah. So this is a moving spectrogram of a single sensor recording an oil film change as a roller passes over. So um, what you kind of get here is like right now you're outside of any kind of contact. And so you get this really flat spectrogram. Um, and as that roller comes in close, you kind of see these ridges forming. Um, and they're the actual resonances towards the inlet of one of those rollers. And then as the roller actually passes over your sensor, like right now you get this really large dip in amplitude mm -hmm. and that's where you get a lot of transmission uh, into your roller. But then on the outlet side of that, you have another one of these meniscus films form and you get those ridges forming again at the outlet. So you can see there on the screen, you get these kind of ripples and that's the actual resonance we're talking about. So this is just a way to visualize um, that resonance. And then the, the follow on step from this is how do you automate the calculation of that resonance? And all, and all the, uh, the sounds in this are all from the same measurement, I guess, mm -hmm. just uh, rearranged. Yeah. Yeah, so that's probably, well, that's more my realm of, <laughs> yeah. of audio trickery. So let's say we take one raw um, wave file, so not a digital audio file. With, so starts with Will, he sends this data to another colleague of ours, um, who together have, they've written a code that can somehow bring that sort of what you see on the screen there into an audible realm. Um, so then I start with that. And if you hear the start of this piece as well, um, for the first 10 seconds or so, it is just the pure wave audio file. So there's no editing done at that point. That's just what we got from the, the measurement. And it matches along that you see this, you or you hear this sort of, if you know music, phasing sound is like a type of effect or chorusing sound where, and uh, a big up and down swell in the, uh, in the, pit, in the pitch of it. Um, so then after that, we tried to sort of, I don't know, complement the music with edits. So let's say I take the audio file and snip a really, really short part of it and then use what's called granular synthesis to just repeat that over and over and over again. Then you can map um, corresponding notes that that produces to a keyboard and then create some kind of amplitude, uh, dynamic playable instrument. And then as you'll hear it sounds a bit dance music later on but every single sound you hear is from that waveform so in in one way I, I may have found zoomed in and found let's say a big cresting peak and then if i take that and then compress and distort and maybe boost the amp at the gain of it um and then squash it back down again you can create what you know like a kick drum sound or something that thuds or beats and that sort of the drum components and then something really small if you take away other sounds uh, and you create a small, let's say, chop, then you kind of lose any resonance because resonance, if you hear, think about your ears, it only works over time. You only hear something resonating if you hear it for more than a split second. Before that, it becomes quite percussive. So you can just chop small little bits of the sound and they'll have different timbres to them, depending where you chop out of the audio file. So one might sound more woody, one might sound more tinny and crispy. Um, and then, yeah, those little bits I said, oh, that sounds good. It might sound similar to a hi hat or a, a snare drum might sound mm. like. I might layer it up on its, you know, duplicate it a few times. And, and that sort of idea of granular synthesis as well, that, that's basically the idea of, of oscillating anything for sound purposes, because you could just draw a waveform, one cycle of, let's say, 400 hertz. And on its own, it would be nothing. It'd be so quick, you wouldn't be able to hear it. But all you're doing is repeating it over and over and over and over. And then suddenly you've got an audible sine wave or a pure tone. So that's all I'm doing here is taking a little snapshot of this audio, for example, repeating it over and over again. And suddenly you've got a different sound out of this original sound. So I sort of blended the two so it didn't come too far from the original at any point that you can always hear in the background as the original sound sort of rolling and and moving so that the timbre is not dissimilar. Um, it just sort of expands the ideas and then comes back around at the end, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's interesting. You're 
so you know, you know, like purely synthetic music, I think they generate their own waves and then mm -hmm. you know mess around with uh, the amplitude and the wavelength phase and and combine them together. And um, but then they sometimes I hear them talk and they try to originally I think they were trying to mimic mm -hmm. real instruments mm -hmm. uh, with you know purely synthetic uh, electronic generated sounds but yeah, yeah. you're you're a little different you're taking real sounds mm -hmm. and maybe altering them a little bit but the, the source is from a real so it's i don't know music you know i guess the thing about music is if you where did it all start probably people heard sounds and nature mm -hmm. in the real world and something uh sounded good to them and so they you know tried to figure out ways to repeat it or control it and make, maybe it just grew from there yeah um, yeah you know that, and, yeah that's interesting what you're saying there because it's um <laughs> not many people know that that like yeah if you see the waveform of a piano key it has a certain characteristic as opposed to the waveform of an oboe or something like that and like you say you can use synthetics computer code whatever to um, go in there and basically draw that same waveform and then suddenly you've got a playable fake instrument that sounds close to a piano yeah. but then the, the problem always yeah. being is, is it usually sounds fake because you don't have all the um, incorrect harmonics above it and you don't have the variations in amplitude and the dynamic range and the softness and the timbre all those little bits that come with the acoustic instrument but yeah Exactly as you said, we've sort of done it in a weird uh, Frankenstein kind of way of making almost electronic-y sounding instruments or synthet synthetic sounding instruments out of real sounds that had no kind of, we had no say in what they were originally. We just took them as they were and then made sounds out of them. And I think it, it could be taken even further, this sort of idea, and you could try and make um, digital violins and keyboards uh, and pianos and things like that from these sounds if you really really went into detail and said i'll just take right. I'll pinch that bit and pinch that bit but then it, it, it comes to a point where you sort of stop really appreciating what the source sound is because it's so far removed and right. i think that's that's what we're trying to go with here that you could the timbre might sound a bit different when these sort of synthesized sounding instruments come in but you always hear the true sound it's always there in the background or it starts with it and it's you know it's never a complete departure from the, the source sound you never too far from the origin I would yeah say, which is nice yeah, yeah it's it's almost like a, it, maybe a good analogy is like paintings uh i guess you know older i guess renaissance you know, most of it was realism when they painted what they saw and they got good at that but then it kind of regressed and they uh seem to get farther and farther and farther from the real the original image mm -hmm. right yeah so like, it's more impressionist and then yeah impressionist but then eventually you know some of the modern stuff is like cubism or just shapes mm -hmm. and um and so i mean I, I don't know it's it's art so it could be anything you want but i guess you yeah. might lose some of the organic or the the real world that the farther you go to to uh, just purely synthetic or purely broken down, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like a, a Picasso, you can see why it is, but we've had a lot of fun changing it around. So <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. A lot we're painting, but there's little bits and pieces everywhere, which makes it more interesting. Yeah, I it's mean, got its character, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's like, uh, and then people uh, compare uh, Picasso to like children's paintings, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they'll say, "Oh, my kid could do that, right?" But there, maybe that's where the art is: is that he was able to do it, but he's also conveying something. But bring it back to the music, you know. You're, I don't know if you have kids, but when they're real little, like you know, that maybe banging on a pot or a pan or do something, you can make some kind of music. Uh, but then I guess depending on who does it, it gets refined into. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's often 
discussion the purpose, isn't it? Or, yeah. <laughs> the idea behind it that's why people want to know what, what what was you thinking in writing that or making that and drawing that or studying this and doing this it's sort of what's your idea behind it and i think that's probably one of the great things about this project was that the, the two ideas behind um from both sides of music and science were quite in one way completely different but in the other exactly the same you're trying to discover something novel you're trying to uh, express <laughs> your own passions and your own your own interests, or study what you love, basically, or, or do what you uh, enjoy. And yeah, we've sort of taken one and the other, um, and yeah, merged them in a fun fun way. I mean, one of the actual first reasons this is secondary, I think, before you started, it, but Rob, um, who's my supervisor for this work and has worked with us and Dave. Um, one of the things he was kind of saying before was, can we somehow transfer these resonances into a sound that you can listen to? He could almost use that as like a fault detection system. So rather than having to look at these spectrograms and stuff, could you record something and play it to yourself and just quickly listen and almost like, uh, you know, like condition monitoring almost of a machine through the sound, um, which is actually what they used to do on bearings, you know, way back when they'd have someone listen to a bearing, you know, does that sound normal and what does it sound off? Can we actually do that in much more depth and detail with this? And then from there, we've actually then, you know, Dave's come and taken like a completely different motivation that made something really cool from, uh, I guess, what started off as like an engineering motivation to getting this like really cool track out there just from having a completely different perspective yeah. of what you want to get out of doing the work. I think it one thing inspires the other as well, yeah, doesn't definitely. it? So if it's an engineering challenge and then I've come along and said, well let's just let's just do something fun with it. Yeah, solve the engineering problem by showing this to people and then people seeing this idea, they get more inspired to then solve the engineering problem or at least use this sort of this method anyway. So when, I, when we were at STLE in um, Long Beach last month, um, the amount of people who'd come up and, and speak or ask questions about this, um, who were academics or industry, so, you know, they're mainly a scientific background, but said, so what, I'm guessing then you could use this to solve this problem or for this purpose, like Will says, using it as a sort of, well, I know that if it sounds like that, there's a problem. If it sounds like this, there's this kind of problem, which is different but it's just another way of getting getting your answers, getting your data results. And I said, you know, from the, not the most technical point of view, yeah, it, it can, why not? Like, you know, run with it, run with the idea. So it inspires then people to go, oh, right, that same thing can give me what I want in a different way. I can solve the problem in a different way. And then what does that inspire? So it's sort of like one thing led to the other, led to the other, led to the same thing again, and back around and inspired. Uh, yeah, more people, I guess. Yeah, so there's a couple of things I want to get to based on what you said. So, uh, yeah, you're talking about you have different sounds if it, if it's something's operating properly or failing. I mean, I know you go into a tribology lab if you're doing a friction wear experiment, and so if it sounds continuous, and usually it's not a bad sound, but if you come in there and it's screeching and making terrible noises usually means it's also bad or severe wear or something's going on a lot of con solid contact so you know is there you think there's a connection with uh you know people's emotions and sound and different you know like a and then in the travology maybe there's some kind of connection with good mechanical sounds, bad mechanical sounds, and maybe through evolution, that's also tied into our uh, perception of those sounds, whether it's pleasant or not. Um, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking. Kind that's of a great question. Is a screeching sound bad because you now associate it with something going horribly wrong? I mean, I don't like a screeching sound. <laughs> right. Because I've heard screeching sounds before, or is it, you know, is it uh, something it's just hardwired into DNA. Yeah, is there something in travology then that if something's irregular or, or resonant or screechy, that does that mean it's bad or it's not? Yeah, like Rob says, it, does, does that mean there's too much contact or yeah. too much friction going on? Yeah, I yeah. mean, if you're screeching, something's going wrong for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of strange that the what we consider bad 
where bad friction is have a bad sound. Mm, yeah. I, I have no idea where that came from. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I've got my own theories because part okay. of part of um, studying acoustics engineering is also studying psychoacoustics, which is I love how they still keep that in an engineering qualification is the sort of human perception of sound because it's important. It's important for things like noise regulations and um, and machine, you know, right. assessing machine noise, which is what, what I used to do a lot for my old job. Because what's the difference between a, a screeching tonal noise and a rhythmic banging noise psychoacoustically? And, and the whole idea is that screeching and tonal noises are more impactful if they relate to your your own perception of hearing. So that like older people have less hearing in the higher ranges, you know, up to 20, from 10 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz, they have a lot less generally young people have uh, a lot more up there. So higher resonance frequencies sound worse to people younger generally again. Yeah. So that sort of screeching noise will, but then there's also an element of like evolutionary psychology that a baby's cry can be at a certain pitch and it's usually, you know, between uh, let's say 2K and 10K. So within that region, that's where it's most resonant. And that's also mathematically in line with how long our ear canals are. So that, you know when you hear a noise, <laughs> <laughs> when you hear a noise, and, it, and, and men traditionally have um, a slightly longer ear canal, meaning that this is a complete stab in the dark. I've just heard the theory that they hear children less, or they hear the cry of a baby I less. Think so. Yeah, yeah, more, yeah. like a baby cry. Exactly. Yeah. So there might be an element of screeching resonant sounds like that indicate crying child danger. Yeah. You know, something's wrong so I that, that's i've bodged a few ideas together there but <laughs> no yeah there's definitely something to it uh and then i guess the other side of it is that you know you were starting to talk about is you know you did this and I, you could use it practically but is there another is there another benefit to uh trying to to combine these together maybe you know the the science the tribology and the sound and art toward uh if you're of steam science technology engineering art and math so it's mm. stem but they had the art in all right <laughs> so what, you know i think there's a benefit to uh society or getting the word out about tribology and engineering and science through doing art yeah, I yeah. think you've kind of hit it on that. Do you have any? Yeah. Well, I, go well? um, I mean, in terms of using kind of practical measurement, there, there's a lot of ways we do. We use sounds and vibrations, I think, in engineering already. And like, even to go back to the berry stuff, you know, one of the main ways you do it now is like with an accelerometer. So you look at really uh, high frequency vibrations again, but you know, way back when, when bearings first came out, uh, this was a story I actually heard the other day that they actually, original bearing manufacturers used to employ blind people because they had a more acute sense of hearing. Um, mm. So kind of original condition monitors, when you first manufacture a bearing, mm. you'd have someone who was blind has a very acute sense of hearing yeah, kind of listen to these things wow. and say, is that good or bad, you know, um, before it kind of come off the production line. So our kind of thinking was this, was, you know, can we, can we go a step further? Because the kind of, resonance we're seeing here you'd never hear audible but if you can record it and kind of do Dave's method of uh, making it into an audible thing is that then just an extra tool you can have uh, in your arsenal I guess and we're just you know constantly trying to explore ways that you can use the different little things that you record is there any kind of tangible benefit from that uh, can't come from an engineering perspective essentially is what's the most you can get out of your data essentially when we're doing these things that's what we're always yeah. trying to do like get data and absolutely rinse yeah. it and squeeze yeah. it and get every piece of value we can uh, from that that's cool though the multi-purpose data because i think that's yeah. how i see it maybe from a different point it's just like i'm like a kid in a sweet shop i think that's why i've always loved yeah. um i just love science and engineering as well as music and creativity because if you look at <laughs> the inside of a recording studio it's not dissimilar from the inside of a cockpit or something, yeah, there's buttons and slides, <laughs> yeah. things, that, things that make things happen and change. 
in all sorts of configurations. And then when I see like mechanical engineering labs and, and machines and things, they are to me just instruments. Why not? Because, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then I think one thing inspires the other. Like, um, I think, I, I don't even know if by chance I mentioned an idea of this and Rob had already mentioned it prior to you guys. And then we go, oh, I already had that idea. Let's run with yeah, it. Maybe, yeah. Because I just remember seeing spectrograms and going, Ooh, can I hear that? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. it looks like it might sound cool as well as looking cool. Right. So I, I think for me, with science, um, with steam, um, yeah, I just love the idea that anything can be repurposed. Yeah. And like, why the hell not? And and if that also means that you suddenly inspire a new wave of creative tribologists, then that's not a bad thing, is it? And or, or you just inspire a load of musicians or artists to go out and speak to a load of engineers or a load of scientists and say you know let's work together why not because i don't know i personally spoke to a lot of people from industry at the conference recently and they just like it for its own sake and that's always been art it's, yeah. you just, it doesn't have to have an additional purpose yeah but it's amazing that it does you yeah, know? yeah it's like it is what it is, and appreciate it for what it is, and other people will, but then they'll ask more questions. And that's where it comes in, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think it's very valuable. So uh, maybe it's not as much of an issue in Europe, I'm not sure, but in the, the US, tribology is not, it gets, kind of gets left behind. Mm. I mean, engineer, there's always a, a movement to try to encourage kids to go into engineering and science. And that's one thing, but even tribology is even farther behind, I think, in that aspect. And so things like this maybe can help. Um, you know, if you post this on YouTube, maybe kid will find it and uh, it'll spark his interest or her interest to go into uh, or look into this field more, even if they don't go into it, just to know more about uh, tribology and its importance because it's doesn't always get remembered, you know, so. Uh, I think it kind of gets really overlooked cool. uh, than what I what I've seen at least. Uh, of something else I'll point out though, um, you're talking about the recording studio. You might mm -hmm. you might have heard this before, but you know, you know vinyl records. Mm -hmm. They uh, those the grooves are on the nano scale that play back mm -hmm. the music. So those those could be said could be one of the first nano technologies. The the vinyl records. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, you know that that's a little roughness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of this also you've heard of you you heard of uh, Brian Eno. I love Brian Eno. Yeah. yeah, this kind of your music kind of reminds me. This I'm not sure if he used all synthetic or just or recorded sounds too, but I think he did recorded sounds because it's kind of like gritty or. Um, seems like you know. Pure digital is less. You just your screen just paused. You hear me still? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you back? Yeah, we're back. Can Sorry, you hear us? Then. Yeah, so your screen froze, and then <laughs> yeah, you were just in uh, Brian Eno. Yeah, so just uh, his. To me, his music sounds has like a grittiness to it. So maybe it's, I think he's using real sound similar to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you use just pure synthetics, it's like smooth usually or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's the difference to me in, in, in terms of, um, yeah, you use words like grittiness and smooth. So the two pieces of outreach audio, one was the hip simulator, one was the, the ultrasonic bearing data. To me, they have that. One of them sounds really gritty this one's more smooth and, and sort of, I don't know how to describe it further, but almost like contained because like the, the audio we could get out of this didn't have this wide range of low and upper harmonics. It was more like a particular tone that washes and changes. Whereas the hip simulator, you put a microphone in there and between 20, and 20, uh, 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz, you've got all number of random things going on. Yeah. that it just it gives it a different timbre, different sort of texture of sound anyway. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. Brian Eno, big, uh, big fan. So I like okay. it. Okay. Uh, 
I don't have too much else. You have any other thoughts? Um, anything you want to convey? I think we've covered most of all. I wanted to. <laughs> how long does it take to... you to do one of these pieces, or how? Oh, okay. Um, I think that's always a how long's a piece of string question. <laughs> <laughs> when things are going well, I could. I think actually the, the second piece, the the ultrasonic bearing piece came together in about two days then there's always two or three weeks or months of editing and tweaking sounds but the bare bones came together in two days so I pretty much as you hear it now was almost there in two days but the hip simulator sounds um that was about five months and it's one oh, song wow. so yeah one song could be in a few days could be half a year yeah. could be a year it just depends because I might start with a load of sounds in the hip simulator case. I had lots of different audio tracks because I recorded it in different ways. So I think that's a good lesson in creativity that less is more like give yourself less choice on what sounds you're going to use. Cause we only had this, well, they were all different variations of the same sound They're different. Sorry, no different loads on there. So slightly different. It was from the same sensitive as the yeah. similar thing that was happening. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, Change, yeah. Slightly changing the mechanics, but it was all that's it. Very comparable, so yeah. Yeah, so one sound didn't sound a million miles no. from the other, and right. that was the difference for me. I think, and I, I love that because at home in the studio, I often, um, I just recently, in recent years, have started downsizing, get rid of instruments, get rid of sounds. No, really? you don't use them very often um, because it just creates more of a block in your head if you go should I do it this way this way this way this way this way or if you just go well I've only got this way to do it yeah. I've oh. only got one way to do right. it make it work in that way how, how many it, instruments do you play um, <laughs> or what instruments do you play so I started as a classical pianist as a kid so probably about 27 or 8 years playing piano and then Guitar, bass, drums, I sing, and I <laughs> tried to play the viola, but I just couldn't do it. I think that was my Achilles heel. That seems like a... Well, so bring a violin, I wanted to mention, we had a, another video, a guy named uh, Woodhouse from Cambridge. Okay. Right. And he, uh, he's an expert in the science of the instruments. Oh, we saw this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he's putting out a book, I guess, online for free. Nice. So you might want to look him up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but he's a, was it a flutier that, that makes instruments too? Right. Um, so I guess cool. he came into it that way. Um, so are you in a band now or are you uh, or in it just like solo you know, or <laughs> yeah. you're the band? That's the band. Yeah, double act. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 was in, I was in bands for years. I think most musicians go through that rock rock band phase even though I'd probably still live that life if I could um but I write and compose a lot so I do a freelance composition work and sound design so you may be working for animations or advertisements um cool. and then I I perform live generally on my own um but with a mixture of synthesizers cassette tape machines um I'm doing a gig in September where I'm using a, a, an acoustic piano but I'm going to make it my own. So I'm going to bring some hmm. guitar pedals, a contact mic. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and just, it's sort of dance and electronic, ambient. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff. Do you have a, where can people find information about your work or do you have a website um, or? Yeah, so if, if they go to davidjohnbrady.com um, or Google David John Brady, because luckily not many people use a triple barrel name like that. <laughs> so <laughs> I think my Spotify uh, page is a good place to find most of my music. Well, it, send me the link and I'll put it when I post this. Uh, sure thing. Uh, your, your link. Um, you know who John Tichy is? John Tichy. So it, no. He's another uh, musician who was in Tribology. Mm -hmm. He was in a band, uh, Commander Cody... And the space kid, I probably got the wrong, it was like space cadets or something. Like but it's, uh, he's from like the 60s and 70s. And yeah, uh, but I think at one point he had to make a decision of like, and they got, I think they were fairly popular, but they, mm -hmm. uh, he 
went the route of tribology for his oh no career but um they had some songs and uh i'll send you some stuff but yeah please two do. years ago he they him and his uh, son they played at a tribology conference just some <laughs> songs um, bringing it back around yeah i never want to choose between science and music though <laughs> yeah I, I mean it's hard to that's how he puts it i don't know it seems like yeah. if you could do both at the same time and keep it going that's great but yeah yeah see, right. or just do what i do keep keep, keep signs at an arm's length <laughs> <laughs> bring music in where you can i mean uh, it seems like if you go really want go deep dive into something it takes mm -hmm. a lot of your energy and focus yeah. and yeah, you know, I think it's hard I, to go back between the two. I've probably never has been as focused as well as because, like, <laughs> yeah, like you say, to, <laughs> don't to tell like, your boss that, but yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> no. I'm, a, I'm a jack of all trades, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try to send you that too about John Tucci because it's yeah, an no, interesting. Yeah, uh, you meet people every once in a while who have you know, done both. And he always, you connected him. He said they weren't connected at all. Right. When I was trying to talk to him about it, so. Oh, amazing, uh, yeah. Well, tell him yeah. it can be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I intend not to make this an advertisement, but I intend to do this with other things because I love the idea. Like, it, it's been such a fun project and worthwhile that why can't you apply this to so many of those subjects or areas that are deemed to be dry and un uninteresting unless you're the specialist? I think the nature of tribology and things rubbing <laughs> yeah. owes itself yeah. to music, doesn't it? There's it already does. a lot of cool sounds and yeah, yeah, to yeah. Do and yeah, we have uh, leads as well on like mm. uh, teeth contact and things like that. And there's how cool it be to like record the sound of someone's teeth and. <laughs> Yeah, and that would be a bit weird, a bit squeamish. But right. it's interesting yeah. to hear, anyway. And that that would get me the Mercury Prize. That yeah. <laughs> if you could microphone up the little teeth content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the what prize? Mercury Prize. The Mercury Prize. That, that's that's the dream for any any sort of songwriter musician okay. in the UK. Anyway, it's um, yeah, yeah. It's like the most prestigious award for an album. So not a single or uh -huh. a, a live one. It's just always an album. Okay. You've written an album that is deemed to be critically and sort of everything good, <laughs> you know, not not just it sold the most, doesn't have to sell a lot, it just has to be considered to be really, really top of the top of the right. Game. So yeah. it's more yeah, like a art or yeah, high level, I guess. Yeah, I think so like not not necessarily pop or yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, because you have. You have anyone win it. Um, you have people into rap or electronica, country folk. It doesn't necessarily matter. Yeah. It's just a good album, and if it's a good album and everyone agrees it's the best album of the year, then yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> tribology the album. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one thing I was thinking about: we have a uh, road here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you've heard about this, but you can put grooves in a road, and when you drive over it, it makes plays the tune. Oh, yeah. the right speed. There's one of these yeah. on campus here. Right. That, that some guys put together. Um what's the tune? It's it's the Auburn University fight song. All right. <laughs> So if you're not from Auburn University, you wouldn't have a clue when you're driving over. No, I mean, it's, yeah, it's like a, a ba you know band song. Yeah. But, um, uh, but they, you know, they have to, there's some tribology to that too, because I think they have to replace it every couple of years because it wears out. Yeah, right, um, right. Um, but if, but you're, then... if you're right next to it, like there's, a, a, sometimes there's events near it. It can, if, if there's a lot of cars going by, you'll hear it over and over and over. Would, would you not would you not have like um the doppler effect if you stood near it because if you're in the car it's sort of yeah i think so i'm not sure how that's a good question i think there is there must be i know they have a sign that says you have to drive i think it's 30 miles per hour when you go over it okay yeah so if you go over it fast of course it's going to mess up the <laughs> yeah 
the tuning, I guess, right? <laughs> as it comes towards you and then goes away. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's coming up in pitch. Oh, it's going down. In pitch. I mean, it's a really short uh, little stretch. Then, to, right. you know, it's not. It's only a few notes, but uh, I think there's um, an acoustics PhD in there somewhere. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, maybe last question because I yeah I talk about this with, before with people. There's um, you know, and and sounds like you're you have some classical music background, but um, you know, there's certain frequencies for the notes. And why did we pick those frequencies? Is there some underlying reason why we picked, I forget what the Hertz is, but there's a certain Hertz for like C and- Oh, like 440. Yeah, why, why did we pick these and why? how did these get? Because all of our, all the, especially Western music too, I think, I'm not sure if everybody picks these same mm -hmm. notes, but everything's it's based on these notes. Uh, this is interesting, isn't it? Because you show a child, a, a tiny child, a piece of music, and sometimes it elicits an emotional response. But then that, like you say, is in a Western tuning because yeah. East, Eastern tunings are mathematically different to a Western tuning. So the, the relationship between one sound and another is in a different ballpark. It's like using two different equations. Yeah. So like, I, I've always wondered the same in, in um, classical, Western tuning, your 440 hertz plus, uh, and then your 880 hertz is one octave above. It's, right. it's, it's a doubling, sorry, halving of wavelength. Yeah. So it's all mathematically related. Yeah, there's all ra uh, fractions of yeah. it. Yeah. And I thought that's why we enjoyed it as people because it fits nicely into whatever our head's trying to do. It's a pattern. Yeah. But then an Eastern scale might equally be a pattern, but different <laughs> who knows yeah who knows um all right well uh we've covered a lot of ground and i enjoy talking to you all and thank you for yeah. taking the time it's to do this up is it okay with you if i i'll put that the other song earlier we talked about maybe i'll take there was i think it was the hip song maybe i'll put it at the end sure thing okay with yeah. you and uh you have anything else you want to add or no no it's all right it's, yeah, it's been it's been good great. thank you Ron. You're Pleasure. welcome. I, I actually missed this at STLA. I wish I had <laughs> yeah. so much of that conference. Like mm -hmm. I, I overlooked what you were doing. I should, I wish I had seen it. Um, yeah. Do you plan to be back at STLA next yeah. year or other? Maybe uh, it's a long ways for you all. I know. So. It's a long way. Yeah, we'd like to. It, de it depends. To. It depends for me what scientists require my services. I. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to the Leeds conference at Leeds Leon. So I've been to Leon. Okay. But I haven't yeah. been to Leeds. Yeah. Well, so, I may see you at Leeds sometime. That's where I am. Maybe. I'd say like every two years. I was thinking about this year, but yeah, there's other stuff going on. It's always... <laughs> uh, the World Tribology Congress is in uh, Brazil in a couple of years. That's going to be interesting. Oh, there you go. Yeah, um, that's in Rio, I think, isn't it, actually? Yeah. So that'll be a little bit different. I think it'll be great. Um, but anyway, yeah, keep in touch. And uh, yeah, sure. um, anything else you want to email me about later, feel free to do so. And uh, I'll probably take me some time to go through all the editing. of it. It's not too much, but just I'm going on vacation next week. And so <laughs> maybe that bit where our internet dropped out or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll just cut that out and stuff like that. <laughs> human touch, why not? Yeah, um, but I appreciate it. I think I think we covered some interesting things, and uh, it's been cool. it'll be interesting to some people. Yeah, All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ron. Yeah, thanks for Thank advice. you, and have a good evening, good dinner. Yeah, have a nice day. <laughs> have a nice week. I'll see you. I'll talk to you later, maybe here right. at some point. And, uh, yeah, right. Bye. Cheers, Rob. Yeah. Bye-bye.